Good morning, everyone, and a good afternoon and evening to those of you joining us from different parts of the world. It is so great to see such a large and wide audience today. My name is Nicole Bibin Sadaka, and I'm the Executive Vice President of Freedom House. I just want to thank each and every one of you for being here for the launch of this really important report, Nations in Transit 2024. For over a quarter of a century, Freedom House has been tracking the state of democracy across 29 countries from Central and Eastern Europe all the way to Central Asia. If you're new to Freedom House, we're a nonpartisan non and not nonprofit organization dedicated to advancing and defending freedom globally. Since 1941, our organization has been sounding the alarm on the threats to freedom around the world working with policymakers and other influencers to tackle authoritarian challenges and offering direct support to the brave individuals that are leading the charge for democracy and safeguarding fundamental human rights across the globe. Our Nations in Transit report is an essential vehicle that we use to capture the health of democracy in this crucial region. This year's report is entitled a region reordered by autocracy and democracy, and it could not be more timely or more telling. We're at a pivotal moment, and we are witnessing firsthand how the balance between the democratic strength and the authoritarian influence is really reshaping our world. Our report this year doesn't just lay out the stark realities of nations under auto autocratic rule. It also celebrates the resilience and the courage of those that are standing firm for democracy. It's a call to action for everyone who believes in democracy, showing us just how crucial our support and solidarity are for those that are on the front line of this crucial battle. The path ahead is challenging. But I remain deeply optimistic. And this optimism stems from the amazing activists with whom we are able to partner. Their unwavering courage is remarkable. If we keep pushing for democracy and human rights to guide the policies and actions of the world's democratic governments and organizations, I am certain and I believe that we can turn the tide. We have a packed agenda today. First, Mike Smeltzer, who is one of the two co-authors of this of the Nations in Transit report, will take us through the key findings of this year's report and provide insight into the most salient trends in the region. We'll hear from David Kramer, the executive director of the George W. Bush Institute and the vice president of the George W. Bush Presidential Center and a former president of Freedom House. After that, we'll open the floor to our esteemed panel, for their insights and analysis. Before we dive in, let me just do a quick reminder. There's a Q&A function. Please use that. That function exists in the bottom of your screen for any questions that you'll have. We will try to address as many as we can before we wrap up. And also feel free to join the discussion on social media with the hashtag Nations in Transit. Thank you everyone for making the time to be here. Mike Smelter, as I mentioned, is our senior research analyst for Europe and Eurasia at Freedom House. He is an extraordinary asset to our team. He joined Freedom House in 2019 and has been managing the Nations in Transit report since 2021. We are so incredibly lucky to have him on our team, and it's my pleasure to introduce him for today's presentation. Mike, over to you. Thank you, Nicole. And thank you everybody for being here for this uh, today's presentation of our findings of Nations in Transit 2024. Let me open up the slides for everybody. So before I dive in, I wanna start with a few thank yous of my own and then give a very quick introduction to the methodology of this report. First, we are grateful to our generous donors who make this research possible, particularly the US Agency for International Development for its longstanding support. And I wanna express my deep appreciation to our incredible network of country experts, peer reviewers, and advisors for their commitment to ensuring that this research is both accurate and impactful. And lastly, a huge thank you to everyone who put such a monumental effort into making this year's report a reality, especially my co-author, Alexandra Carpi, and my colleagues, Mary Hopkins and Katie LaRoque. Now, as Nicole said, Nations in Transit is Freedom House's annual report that evaluates the state of democracy in the region stretching from Central Europe to Central Asia. 
And this report focuses on democracy's institutional underpinnings. To provide a better understanding of the health of democracy's institutions in the broadest sense, each year we score all 29 countries in this region on seven indicators that assess the health of those, of those institutions. And based on those scores, Freedom House assigns each country to one of five regime types, ranging from consolidated democracy to consolidated authoritarian regime. Now let's move on to the main findings. This report documents the 20th consecutive year of declining democratic governance across this region. In 2023, democracy's institutional foundations experienced further democratic setbacks amid escalating authoritarian attacks on basic rights and liberties. Of the 29 countries covered in this report, 10 suffered declines in their democracy scores, while only five earned improvements. And over the last two decades, we've this process has been driven by a complex combination of country-specific and region-wide causes, from abusive policymaking to manipulated elections to the vilification and degradation of civil society and the independent media. And as this graphic here shows, the 10 countries that have declined the most over the last two decades include both countries that never achieved full democracy and those that achieved EU membership for their monumentally difficult but successful democratic transitions from a communist system. And while each country's democratic story is, is unique, and you can read more about each of them on our website, there is nevertheless a common through line that ties these countries together over these last 20 years of democratic decline. And that is that across the region, illiberal, anti-democratic, and authoritarian actors have increasingly attacked and undermined democracy's foundational institutions. Decades of deterioration in these democratic institutions have norms have profoundly reshaped the region that we see today, widening the gulf between nations committed to liberal to principles of liberal democracy and those where such values are overtly rejected. Now, Moscow's war to destroy Ukraine and the Azerbaijani regime's military conquest of Nagorno-Karabakh are the two most glaring examples of this disdain that today's autocrats hold for fundamental human rights and pluralist societies. And these and other events in recent years have accelerated what is a geopolitical reordering in the region, with countries sorting themselves into two opposing blocks, the transatlantic community of democracies on the one hand, and the entrenched autocrats on the other. And this reordering is hugely consequential for those 11 hybrid regimes caught between the two camps because it's clear that there is no third option. And the reality of 20 years of democratic decline has itself undermined a key assumption of the creators of this report back in 1995, namely that the countries in this region after the fall of the Soviet Union would progress towards the same endpoint of peaceful and democratic consolidation. But to help us better understand the impacts that this reordering is having in this region's democratic trajectory, let's begin by examining these three groups, the democracies, the hybrid regimes, and the autocracies. We'll start with the good news. Many of the region's democracies have responded to this reordering by shoring up their domestic democratic institutions. Of the five countries that earned improvements in their democracy scores for the events of 2023, four are categorized as semi-consolidated or consolidated democracies. In the consolidated democracies of Slovenia and Lithuania, multi-year efforts to improve media financing has bolstered the work of independent media. Elsewhere in the semi-consolidated democracies of Romania and Bulgaria, years of slow, painstaking work to improve the efficacy and independence of judicial and prosecutorial systems bore fruit in 2023. But Poland was truly a standout case last year, and it's worth spending more time there. In spite of all the manipulative tactics used by the outgoing government to tip the playing field in its favor, a coalition of opposition forces won a historic victory last October. The opposition ran on a pledge to uphold the rule of law and human rights, and a record-breaking number of Polish citizens chose to give them a chance. As you can see from this graphic here, the new government now faces a daunting task to correct nearly a decade of democratic backsliding. Both the depth and breadth of damage to Poland's democratic institutions is monumental, but the path back to democracy is anything but simple. 
the new government cannot simply reverse the previous government's legislation. It must use democratic means to achieve durably democratic ends. Now, the good news is that this new government has access to lessons from its neighbors. The report covers similar challenges that Slovakia, Czechia, and Slovenia have all faced in overcoming or seeking to overcome the damage done to institutions by illiberal leaders. And Poland's ability to recover from democratic backsliding will be crucial for the future of the wider region. The country could set the standard for how to rebuild democracy and also how to take on needed geopolitical leadership at this critical moment for democracy. Now let's turn to the category of countries designated as hybrid regimes, which have characteristics of both autocracies and democracies. As I mentioned before, this group of countries is poised between the region's two geopolitical and normative blocks. And of these 11 countries, only Ukraine experienced an improvement in its democracy score, while five suffered declines. In fact, the Western Balkans accounted for many of the more worrying developments this last year. For instance, Serbia was the country with the sharpest decline in the entire NIT coverage region due to December's fraudulent snap elections and a year characterized by media capture, the cowing of local governments, and years of frozen judicial reform. But Armenia is also worth additional attention this year. The government's efforts uh, to reform since 2018 have been a series of two steps forward, one step back. But in 2023, its democratization efforts were adversely affected by the Azerbaijani, Azerbaijani regime's brutal offensive in Nagorno-Karabakh, which prompted more than 120,000 ethnic Armenians living there to flee west, many into Armenia. And so now the country is facing its own complicated mix of humanitarian, political, and regional security challenges. Now, to bring this back to the key theme of the report, this reordering, all of these countries, as I said, are poised between these two camps. And the geopolitical reordering that's happening in Europe and Eurasia is increasingly pulling these hybrid regimes in different directions, either towards further institutional decline or possible democratic consolidation. And this trend has necessitated a new approach and a new understanding of what's happening. Given that, we introduce a subcategorization of the hybrid regimes on the basis of their democratic trajectory into three broad descriptions, autocratizing hybrids, democratizing hybrids, and cyclical hybrids. First, in the autocratizing hybrids like Serbia, Georgia, governing institutions are increasingly captured by ruling parties and abused for partisan or personal gain. While there is still an opposition and civil society in these countries, their ability to influence policy is more limited. And often corrupt networks in these countries are present and persistent. On the flip side, you have the democratizing hybrids and nations in transit, which have more genuine political pluralism and have shown a real commitment to the reform and strengthening of democratic institutions. At least in this region, the emergence of that political will is often the result of an external catalyzing event like aggression from an authoritarian power. And nowhere is this truer than in Ukraine, where the government took steps in 2023 to improve the effectiveness of Ukrainian courts and anti-corruption bodies, and showed promise in investigating corruption in the judiciary and in the military. The last group is the cyclical hybrids, where regimes may ricochet between democratic and autocratic breakthroughs without ever seeming to achieve a full consolidation in either direction. Montenegro is a case in point here. The end of three years of single party rule in the country has not yet opened a new chapter for democracy. The political landscape there remains fractured between a pre-2020 old guard and a younger class of less experienced officials. And this rift has produced ineffective governance and inter-institutional conflict, which has itself undermined rule of law reforms and allowed organized crime to proliferate. In short, what we're arguing is that it would be a mistake to see this category of countries as a homogenous group. This year, we're really suggesting that democracy supporters be more attentive to each country's democratic trajectory over the last five or 10 years, which may help us reconceptualize this category to develop a new, more tailored policy toolkit. Lastly, 
we have to turn to the eight countries designated as consolidated authoritarian regimes. These states have not only resisted the great wave of democratization that arrived at the end of the Cold War, but actually have intensified their repression and worked to thwart democratization efforts elsewhere. Now, half of these countries experienced score declines for 2023, while the scores for the remaining four countries were already at or near the bottom of the nation's in transit scale. Apart from Rus the Russian military's devastation of Ukraine, the Kremlin's foreign aggression has ignited a relentless and ongoing crackdown on dissent inside Russia, closing the limited space that previously existed for the systemic opposition and grassroots resistance. At the And the death of opposition leader Alexei Navalny in a Russian penal colony just in February has only further illustrated the unyielding punishment of dissent that pervades these autocracies. In Central Asia, autocratic leaders there continued their cycles of power concentration. For instance, we saw this in Uzbekistan, where President Shavkat Mirziyoyev's regime enacted audacious constitutional amendments that cleared the way for him to extend his rule until 2040. Russia's invasion of Ukraine is not the only military conflict in this region that has proven a direct challenge to the international norms of sovereignty and self-determination. As I've already mentioned, the uh, Azerbaijani regime's assault on Nagorno-Karabakh in September last year did, uh, provided this uh, as well. But even prior to September's military onslaught, a months-long blockade deprived Nagorno-Karabakh's people of essential goods. Domestically, President Aliyev has moved quickly to capitalize on this victory by further consolidating power. He called snap elections, uh, moving the presidential election date up by a full year. At the same time, his regime at the end of the year has unleashed yet another crackdown on the remnants of the independent media and political opposition in Azerbaijan. And as democracies have struggled to respond in a decisive and coordinated fashion, the world's autocrats have increasingly cooperated with one another to advanced shared goals. Events in recent years have shown how this phenomenon of authoritarian cooperation is especially prominent in the nations in transit region. For instance, peacekeepers from the Russian-led collective security treaty organization played an important role in quelling unrest in Kazakhstan in January of 2022. Similarly, you can think of when Alexander Lukashenko faced civil unrest surrounding the 2020 presidential election in Belarus, Putin dispatched Russian security and state media personnel to help Lukashenko maintain control. And since then, the regime in Minsk has re repaid the favor by allowing Russia uh, to stage parts of its invasion of Ukraine through Belarus. And autocrats in this region have also found partners further afield. The Kremlin has turned to the regimes in North Korea and Iran, for example, to replenish its supplies of artillery shells and drones for use in Ukraine. Now, Moscow and Baku have demonstrated that wars of conquest are not problems of the past. European democracies were caught woefully unprepared by Moscow's military aggression and have been forced to confront their long-term neglect of what is an essential tool for protecting democracy and human rights, that is, military defense. And now the fate of European democracy depends on the willingness of demo democratic states to adopt a more active approach to security in the region, most urgently by supporting Ukraine. Unless these democracies act urgently and consistently to hold, uphold their own interests and values, more territory will be lost to dictatorship and repression. Indecision and inaction will only raise the costs of countering authoritarianism and defending democracy in the future. And only by reinvigorating our commitment to these democratic principles and by deepening our solidarity with frontline allies can the transatlantic community of democracies ensure that peace and liberty will prevail. Now, this report rec offers numerous recommendations on how the United States and European uh, Union member states can work together to roll back the authoritarian gains and revitalize democracy in the region. Our policy recommendations include calls to support these renewal and reform efforts, especially by, for instance, making rule of law concerns a strategic priority within the EU. We also continue to advocate for seeking accountability for human rights abuses. Democracies must stand in solidarity with human rights defenders from authoritarian states, supporting their work on the ground and, if need be, 
in exile. And lastly, we must ensure that Ukraine wins on Ukraine's terms. Ukraine's victory is inextricably tied to the fate of European democracy and global democracy, I might add. And so for the third year, I must reiterate that a Ukrainian victory would do more for democracy in this region than any other single policy achievement. Now, our report is filled with even more information on policy recommendations, country reports, and all of our data. And we encourage all of you to go read the full report and learn more. With that, I want to thank you for listening to this year's findings for the Nations in Transit report. And I now have the pleasure to turn the virtual mic over to David Kramer for his remarks. Mike, thanks so much. And it's a real pleasure to uh, be with all of you. Congratulations on the report to you, Mike, and your team and everyone at Freedom House, Nicole. Um, it is great to be back with Freedom House, where I spent four years, and it's one of the finest organizations that I have had experience with. So it's great to be back with you and also with this distinguished panel that will follow. Your uh, presentation, I think, certainly identifies what is the challenge we're facing, not just in this region, but around the globe. And that is the battle between freedom and democracy on the one hand and authoritarian regimes, brutal authoritarian regimes, in fact, um, on the other. And it is a, a question between whether we will help democracies in this region survive and thrive, or we will abandon them and leave them to the whims of these authoritarian regimes. The report also reminds us of something that's true around the globe, and that is the way authoritarian regimes treat their own people is often indicative of how they behave in foreign policy. So when the Putin regime kills and poisons and arrests its political opponents, when it cracks down on individuals expressing their thoughts about Russia's unprovoked and unjustified invasion of Ukraine, when it goes after lawyers and drives uh, roughly a million people out of the country as a result of the invasion of Ukraine, we shouldn't be shocked that Russia invades Ukraine, invades Georgia, threatens Moldova, essentially has taken over Belarus, and poses threats to NATO allies and, and members of the European Union. We shouldn't be shocked, as you described, that the Aliyev regime tries to project power against Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, we shouldn't be surprised that the Lukashenko regime uh, which has launched a brutal crackdown after Lukashenko stole the election in 2020, is complicit in Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So the way these regimes treat their own people is often indicative of how they behave. It's not automatically indicative. We look at some of the states in Central Asia, and they tend to stay within their own borders. But the way these regimes treat their own people uh, matters enormously. The report also underscores the importance of civil society and an independent media. And we do see trends um, in, in a number of these countries where they are trying to crack down on these things, where civil society is often viewed as foreign agents. We're seeing this play out in the case of Georgia, which just in the past week has reemerged with uh, legislation that is eerily reminiscent of Russia's NGO legislation, foreign agents designating these agents, these NGOs, as uh, weapons of, of foreign agents, of foreign influence. And you saw the protests in Georgia uh, this week in response to that. We, we see this kind of crackdown elsewhere in the region. And of course, it started in Russia. Russia is often the leader in these kinds of crackdowns against civil society, against uh, uh, independent media. And sadly, a number of these countries in the region follow, follow Russia's example. You, you mentioned Armenia and Azerbaijan. Armenia, I think, will be a particularly interesting country to keep an eye on as uh, the Pashinyan government looks more and more to the West, having felt abandoned by Russia in its war with Azerbaijan. How much uh, leeway will Russia allow Armenia to look more toward the West, given Armenia's very close ties with Russia over the many years uh, but clearly, the, the Armenian people and the Armenian leadership feel that their bet on Moscow has not paid off, and they want to look more to the EU and possibly even toward NATO. Uh, how, how long will that be allowed to occur as long as Russia hangs, a, hangs over Armenia? Um, there, there also are countries in this report that are have done extraordinarily well for years. And I heard from 
uh, two friends in the Baltic states who said, isn't it time for Estonia, in particular, Latvia, Lithuania, possibly even Slovenia, to graduate from this report, from nations in transit, where they're not really in transit anymore. As you've identified, they are consolidated democracies. The comeback to that, of course, is that you want to be able to show that there are success stories in this region and that some countries are perhaps only an election away from moving in the wrong direction. That can be said of a lot of countries. So anyway, food for thought uh, for future reports, should there be uh, consideration given to graduating some countries from coverage coverage in this report. Um, I, I wanna uh, end by turning to one of your recommendations, Mike, that you underscored, and that is helping Ukraine win. Everything in this region and frankly, well beyond depends on whether we will help Ukraine win, whether we will help Ukraine defeat Russia militarily and help Ukraine regain control over all of its territory. The stakes here are absolutely enormous. There is no country, there are no people who want this war to end sooner than Ukrainians. They are the ones who are suffering and dying as a result of Russia's brutal invasion and tactics, bombing civilian targets, and killing as many people as possible. But the Ukrainians are also determined to fight to win. They understand the stakes and they know why they are fighting. For the West, the stakes are also enormous because if we don't help Ukraine stop Russia in Ukraine, then Russia will continue to roll on, threaten Moldova for sure, possibly even threaten countries that are members of NATO. And if that's the case, then we see the implication of Article 5, where an attack on one is considered an attack on all. If we want to help Taiwan prevent and avoid any threat from China, the way to do so is to help Ukraine win this war. And so one of the things that I think is absolutely essential, we need to see the Congress pass the assistance to help Ukraine. This, is, this was needed months ago. It needs to uh, come up for a vote and it cannot happen fast enough. This is about the front line of freedom. Ukraine is fighting for its freedom. It's fighting for its land, its territory, for the lives of its citizens. Putin has been very clear, as have other Russian officials, that the objective here is to eliminate Ukraine as an independent uh, state and, and destroy Ukraine's identity. Instead, what has happened is Ukraine has actually solidified Ukrainians' determination to fight for their identity, for their independence, for their ability to decide their own future free from Russian influence. And so it, it, to me, that recommendation that you have, help Ukraine win, trumps all the others. It is the most important recommendation in there. The other recommendations are important, support civil society, all the other things you have. But if we don't help Ukraine win, those other recommendations won't amount to too much. We will see the Russian threat roll on throughout the region, and we will see other authoritarian regimes feel emboldened as a result of the West's abandonment of, of Ukraine. It is absolutely essential to not just Ukraine's future and freedom and identity, but to our own future freedom and identity, that we stand with Ukraine and help it in this existential crisis that it has faced through nothing of its own doing, but simply because Vladimir Putin woke up one day and decided he would launch a full-scale invasion. Remember, this war has been going on now for just a little over a decade. It started in 2014. For those who think that didn't mean anything, over 14,000 Ukrainians lost their lives from 2014 until 2022. And since the full-scale invasion on February 24th, 2022, the, the toll has been significantly greater. But the last thing I'll leave you with is, even though the West has not stepped up and provided the kind of assistance that Ukraine has needed, frankly, for the past two years, Ukraine has been able to achieve uh, tremendous results in basically destroying half of Russia's conventional military capability, driving the Russian Black Sea fleet out and destroying a third of its ships there in shooting down numerous Russian aircraft, military aircraft that threaten Ukraine, inflicting possibly as many as half a million casualties. The narrative that's out there is that Ukraine is losing and Russia is winning. Ukraine is struggling. 
because we are not helping Ukraine, but Ukraine is still achieving impressive results. Imagine what they could do if we really stepped up our support to help them win, not just fend off Russian forces, but to help them win. And there's a big difference between uh, staying with them as long as it takes and helping them win this war. And if we can help Ukraine win this war, I think we will see benefits from that spread throughout the region and hopefully help a number of these countries and the nations in transit report move in a more positive direction. So thank you again for letting me join you and look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you, David. It's it's good to hear you have not lost that Freedom House voice, that moral clarity that we that we strive for here at Freedom House, and and we appreciate you you taking the time to engage with us. Um, I'm going to now turn to our panel. We've got lots to discuss. Uh, if you would please join me on the Zoom, I'm pleased to introduce Awana Popescu Zamfir, the director at Global Focus Center, Edithskut Shabilska the Assistant Professor at the Institute of Philosophy and Sociology of the Polish Academy of Sciences, and Egon Malici, a political analyst and media writer, and someone I turn to when I try to understand what is happening in the Western Balkans. Now, let's start with the, the good news. Uh, as I mentioned, there were important developments in, in Poland, and so Ed, I'd like to start with you. You know, we think about these historic elections in Poland as a genuine democratic breakthrough and one that maybe the Hungarians nearby can only dream of. But the outcome in Poland was not a foregone conclusion, especially when we think about several years ago, how the scores in uh, our democracy scores in nations in transit between Hungary and Poland seemed really more in lockstep. They were just kind of going down the scale together. So I'm, I'm curious, what really stopped Poland from becoming Hungary? Why couldn't someone like a Kaczynski in Poland uh, maintain power and go down the same road that we have seen uh, Orban go down in Hungary. Thank you, Mike. Uh, so happy to be with you and uh, congratulations on yet another terrific report. Uh, congratulations to Freedom House. Well, Poland is indeed the bright spot of my region, which has been traditionally the doom and gloom when it comes to democratic trajectories in the last 14 years. And speaking of this outstanding systemic outcome in Poland, um, as you just said, like law and justice could not hold him to power and did not go this kind of down the road of urbanization of the country. Uh, what we witnessed in Hungary is that Viktor Orban's system performed not only tremendous democratic backsliding, but massive autocratization as well. And Freedom House told this story many times, how it shifted from liberal democracy to non-democracy, or at least a hybrid thing. And I think we should, you're right, like we should call the spade the spade and, and we shouldn't be shy away from uh, calling it more authoritarian because it's it's a twin deterioration, like both quality of democracy and uh, the, the governance is worsening. When in Poland, um, during the, the PIS rule, there was as well a massive distortion of rule of law and democracy. But I think what was the key that they couldn't push through this autocratization kind of component. Uh, it couldn't get as as far as, as in Hungary. And I'm gonna give you a brief couple of examples about why not. I think the first factor is very structural. So Jaroslav Kaczynski could simply not fully monopolize the state and the economy as to a certain extent as Viktor Orban could succeed with, with the help of his cronies. Uh, the Polish economic assets were not reallocated in this kind of top-down centralized fashion. Uh, and what I'm arguing in my writings is that Poland was also going down the road of patronalism and nepotism over time, but Kaczynski could not extend his informal power onto the economy like Viktor Orban did. Um, it's also very important that the private property and economic and business stakeholders uh, like their properties are mostly protecting in Poland. It's protected and it's not the case in Hungary. Um, so there were some forced buyouts, for instance, in the banking sector, but this was not the bread and butter of law and justice in the last eight years. Um, and of course, decentralization and local multi-level uh, multi governance was key, I think, in this in this process. So Kaczynski could not abolish lo uh, strong local autonomies in Poland. And the local uh, governments, the boy with chips, the, the civil, locally, the civil society organizations were absolutely crucial in this regard. Um, they're still the most powerful vectors of democracy in the country. Um, in contrast to Hungary, Poland could still 
um, I think it still has one of the strongest formalized system of public engagement, for instance. So this is one of the underpinnings, which would, would help to, to keep the, 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 so to say, the, the contextual feature of, uh, of, of Poland. The second key factor is, is, uh, is very institutional in a sense that Poland has a proportional electoral system. I think it's also very important, which means that the Polish opposition went, was in a slightly better uh, situation or position than the Hungarian one. And just to give you one example, uh, the Polish oppositional parties, the, the former one led by Donatus, they didn't have to force themselves to unify on one united list. It's a very important strategic thing because thanks to that, different flanks of the Polish opposition could coordinate effectively and target their own target audience separately. Uh, they follow this kind of check model in this regard. They organize themselves into three different blocks and mobilize successfully their own electorate. Uh, instead of you know cannibalizing each other at the end of the day, um, which means that they technically competed with each other in order to overthrow the government together later on after the elections, um, and for, for that of course they would have to have a fundamental understanding that that Kaczynski's regime is a threat to democracy and there is a no way under no circumstances there is a possibility to cooperate or make compromises with it, and I think. If anything, this is a lesson learned for the Hungarian opposition, for sure. And the third factor to, to wrap it up with is the social component. I think it's also very important that the, the Polish society has been undergoing a silent transformation over time. Uh, we have been witnessing eight years of cultural war, the restriction of abortion, awful lot of hate mongering against sexual minorities and migrants. And it has completely backfired on PIS last year. So as, as, uh, as another scholar, Stanley, uh, Stanley Bill framed it, we've been witnessing the backlash of Kaczynski's cultural backlash within the society. So the undecided electorate was much more concerned about economic issues, lack of stability, safe access to abortion, then the good old culture of war, which was pushed uh, for eight years. And, and this is exactly where the, the Donald Tusk-led opposition could resonate better to this. I mean, together with the civil society, they could successfully mobilize the politically inactive voters, like under people under uh, age under 30, plus the female voters, and they could still galvanize, the PIS could still galvanize their own base. I mean, uh, with this fully negative campaign, with uh, more a panic mongering and demonizing uh, Donald Tusk. Even Viktor Orban's uh, campaign advisors were helping them uh, on the ground uh, to, to push, to shape this up. Um, uh, so it was obviously a strategic blunder because uh, as we've seen, PIS completely lost the potential to form a coalition at the end of the day. So it was first losing touch and then losing the opportunity to join forces with someone meaningful and to get the number uh, down in the side, which hasn't happened. So in a nutshell, I, I see it in these three factors. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's really interesting, I, particularly thinking about the structural challenges, right? When we're thinking about these institutions and the way constitutions work and the way uh, elections work and how they're, you know, in Hungary, you have a little bit of what we see in America as gerrymandering, frankly. And then you have an opposition in Hungary that is not very united and perhaps not uh, very politically adept. And we see now this kind of uh, this new movement coming out to Peter Majar as a result of, you know, the scandals coming out. And it makes me it makes me question whether there's any hope there. I mean, really briefly, do you think there's any hope for some consolidation of opposition movement under this this new figure? Well, that's, that's a terrific question. And whether he's going to be the uniting figure, it remains to be seen. Because uh, what we know for sure is that he has unexpectedly shaken both the ruling elite in Hungary and the opposition. Most expert, experts, I think, would agree that that Peter Magyar is a sort of a crisis phenomena uh, of the Hungarian opposition and the broader political system as a whole. Um, he's doing awful lot of crowdsourcing, recruiting from civil society. It's still a bit like following the, the, the style of Emmanuel Macron in France or Igor Matovic used to do. Uh, in Slovakia. And what we also know for sure is that Viktor Orban's Fidesz has never faced such a political crisis since they started their authoritarian remodeling in 2010. But it remains to be seen whether Magyar will be able to translate current interest into votes in the upcoming EP and Hungarian elections and how this kind of unifying the opposition is going to go, no one can tell at this point. It's really too early to tell. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. 
Alana, this makes me think about, you know, these these European elections that are coming up, right? We've got a jam-packed election schedule coming up in Europe with not only the European parliamentary elections, right? Romania will have to vote on basically every level of government and Bulgaria will return to the polls for the sixth time in three years. And then we just saw Slovakia's presidential elections uh, last weekend. I mean, we're hearing so much about how serious a challenge that Eurosceptic and, and extreme far right or far left parties could pose to a Europe that so drastically needs to revitalize its democratic institutions. So what do you think is the, the cause or the reason that more and more voters are supporting these sort of kind of uh, far right, far left Eurosceptic politicians or parties? Yeah, thank you very much for the question, Michael. I think it's highly relevant. And 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 I would mention a cause for this and then um, um, say an aggravating factor. Um, the cause for this, I think, is really um, a deficit of democratic representation. Um, people who vote for these populists, radicals, um, autocrats for the far right, um, they're, they're not necessarily buying into the ideology. Only a, a fraction of them um, are ideologically aligned with these parties. Um, most of these parties, in all honesty, are opportunists in, in many countries. So their ideology is something they embrace just because it is successful. Um, and the people who vote for them um, vote because these are the only anti-establishment forces that, that where they can actually go to express their anger at feeling underrepresented by the mainstream parties. Um, so essentially, we're dealing with citizens who are disillusioned with uh, the delivery capacity of democracy, whether we're talking um, performance in terms of good governance or we're talking genuinely political representation. You, you mentioned all the, the election rounds uh, that are coming up in Romania, for instance. Um, and I can tell you that citizens in, in, in many countries, not just Romania, feel that the electoral offer that they have to choose from is really actually not adequate to their genuine preferences. So um, they they choose the lesser evil, and, and, and there's already a tradition, I think, in our region uh, in doing so, not necessarily um, someone they, they think will really represent their interests. Um, so what we're dealing with is a kind of a rebellion against the elites whose agenda is seen as very, very much decoupled from the public agenda. Um, just to give you a, an example, for many years, um, Rom Romanian mainstream parties had anti-corruption as their um, top concern, mainly because foreign partners were demanding it. Uh, but, the, but the public, while really... Um, coalescing into a, an anti-corruption constituency, however, felt that socioeconomic issues and, and the quality of life um, came first in, in terms of their own concerns. So for, for a long time now, it's, it's not just something recent, the, the two agendas, the, the public agenda and the political agenda have been decoupled. So uh, what's happening is a lot of the electorate is dissuaded from voting they're, they're gonna stay home, they're not gonna show up, they're not gonna exercise their right. And and those who feel that, they, that they're that they angry enough uh, to want to, pardon my French, stick it to the uh, elites, they're gonna go to the, uh, to the radicals because they're the only option um, to, to formulate uh, that anger. So um, I think what we need is a genuine effort to rebuild that link um, and, and restore representation. And, and that can be done in multiple ways. Ideally, it would be done within the institutions of representative democracy, where we're seeing a lot of um, democratic activity happening outside of politics. We have a vibrant civil society in many um, regional countries. We have a very entrepreneurial uh, class. We, we um, increasingly have citizen assemblies and um, all other forms of... Um, uh, direct democracy, uh, let's say, or deliberation. But that tends to er erode the actual institutions of representative democracy, which are still the best we have. Um, so I think that's, you know, that's one of the reasons uh, that this deficit of democratic representation uh, leads to the success of, of populists and of radicals, not necessarily their agenda, clearly not their policy proposals. 
Um, the aggravating factor, on the other hand, is that we are dealing, especially in our region, with geopolitical um, circumstances, especially regarding security, but also the economy and the and the fallout from the um, Ukraine war, that um, that determines uh, something of an imperceptible dilution of democracy. And I'm I, I I'm a bit surprised that Romania, for instance, has seen a slight. Uh, improvement of its democracy score, because my feeling on the ground is that actually the, the opposite is happening. Um, with a war and, and various crises on our doorstep and, and even within the EU, um, what we're seeing is much more tolerance for stability at the expense of democracy. Um, and and in in Romania, in in EU candidate countries, um, and in many other countries around the region, um, the European Commission or partners in Western European countries or or Washington have been traditionally very uh, influential in determining um, issues like rule of law and 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 other. Um, and, and other elements that deal with um, how healthy our democracy um, has been. Now, the interest of foreign partners goes way more along the lines of, um, um, if we look at Romania, for instance, is it a reliable partner uh, and a constructive partner on Ukraine? Is it a reliable partner in everything that has to do with EU and NATO reform, with um, boosting our defense capabilities, uh, things that have to do with security. And under these circumstances, the governing coalition in Romania, for instance, which is made up of the two mainstream parties, um, is, is doing its utmost to pay lip service to uh, to the foreign partners' need for stability and constructive uh, action on Ukraine uh, in exchange for them not meddling into the electoral, um, the, the, the healthcare status of the electoral process at home. And what that means is what we're seeing is actually a, a deliberate attempt at diminishing the importance of the individual vote because the two major parties that we have are trying to propose joint candidates so that they can control, let's say, or dominate the electoral uh, market. So there's not much democratic competition left. They're, they're proposing very tight deadlines for parties that want to run in elections to gather the necessary signatures and the number of signatures to be able to do so, uh, which essentially eliminates uh, smaller parties and, and again, diminishes democratic competition so essentially it's it's an it's an ongoing attempt to try and and rig if you wish the result of elections in in a pretty legal form but one that is definitely morally wrong and and leads to a dilution of the quality of democracy and so there's a vicious circle people will feel um that the importance of their vote is really not there anymore, that whatever they do, the result is preordained. Um, so then they will either give up and, and then make room for the radicals, make more room for them, or they will go to the radicals to express their anger. And, and because I'm speaking now from the Republic of uh, Moldova, um, where I'm I'm uh, attending another conference, um, I will just mention um, that in the EU enlargement process, Unwillingly, the EU is creating sometimes the conditions for democratic decline in these countries. And the way it's doing so, if, if we look at uh, the government in Chisinau, is that what the EU is saying is you, the, gov the current pro-democratic, pro-European government, are our only option for a partner in EU accession. And, and that is true. But, but the message it gives is we're going to close our eyes on the and you know on the demo, on any um democratic decline that's going to happen as long as it's not too serious because the alternative is a, is that the pro russians are going to win the elections and then we are in a much more dire situation so then people in moldova will feel that if all foreign partners 
coherently send the message, this government is your only option, then what's the point for, for the public uh, holding the government accountable or other democratic uh, parties, let's say, uh, criticizing the government or presenting an alternative to, uh, to government policies? Because again, it's overwhelming if the EU sends the message, well, you know, whatever happens, this is who we want to be in power. And that's been done in the Western Balkans before, and the result has been this stabilitocracy that we have across the, the region and, and democratic decline. Uh, so again, I think the way geopolitical circumstances are interlocked with democratic dynamics is really not conducive to more democracy at, at this point, but rather creates the incentives for uh, the powers that be to, uh, to, to to go the opposite direction and, and thus make room for anti-establishment uh, radical forces. Yeah, thank you, Ana. That's You've touched on so many different points, the, the deficit of democratic representation. I think that's that's something that we feel, that many people feel acutely, even in the United States, heading into important elections later this year. And then you talk about stability at the cost of democracy, and you mentioned the word st stable autocracy. Now, I'm sure Agon and I both had our ears kind of pop up at the same time, thinking about the Western Balkans there. And so, Agon, I want to come to you. You know, in 2023, we saw how international media really heavily criticized the West policy towards the Western Balkans, especially the soft approach towards Serbia and the, the countries whose scores declined the most in this report this year. And so how would you assess the West policy towards the Western Balkans, particularly in this moment that we've described of geopolitical reordering? I mean, what are the gaps? And and you know, thinking of Alana's question, what's the solution? What's the solution to kind of divorce these democracy from stability? What's, what's, the, what's the solution here? Well, thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me. Um, uh, I know there's a lot that can be said about uh, this particular question, but I think generally, uh, you know, the West has lost the plot on democracy uh, in the Western Balkans. And I think if we want to summarize two of the main sort of structural reasons, I think that these were mostly, you know, some external shocks that have hit hit us as a region uh, uh, over the last decade, especially. First is, you know, the enlargement fatigue. So the EU's uh, sort of inability or the feeling that the EU is unable to absorb new members. Uh, this kind of removed this external anchor that we had for, for democracy. Uh, we were and are fragile democracies uh, uh, without that. And so without the EU kind of, pulling uh, the, these reforms, uh, you know, this has made us even weaker. Uh, and the second key dynamic is, is, I think, the Russian aggression against Ukraine, but but against Europe in general. And I think this is where the Western Balkans feature prominently because they're seen as a front where Russia wants to sort of cause problems and uh, uh, for the West. So this kind of uh, tilted what Juana said, you know, created this sort of security versus democracy kind of a, a dilemma and prioritized security. And what it has, what this has done, I think, is over the last decade, what we've had in the Balkans from the West uh, and the EU in particular is not a policy of enlargement and democratization, but a policy of containment um, at the detriment of democracy, of course. But I would argue also in the long run at the detriment of security, even though security is sort of said that to be the priority. And this containment policy, as you said, you know, you know, you, you said Serbia, uh, you know, the West has been soft on Serbia, has been Serbia centric in a way, because Ser there's this uh, idea that Serbia is the country with the ability to cause most problems, being that is a Russia proxy in terms of security, and that the region cannot move forward without a pro Western Serbia. Now, obviously, that is, you know, there's a case to be made that the, the region would need a pro Western Serbia. But what the current policy has done is that it has allowed Vucic to sort of have to set the agenda for the region, sort of his pro-Western turn, you know, would have to happen under his terms. And what that means is having Serbia sort of have veto power over regional countries. So the impact has been, as you said, Serbia's decline uh, corresponds also with decline regionally because, you know, Serbia has such a tremendous impact throughout the countries uh, of the region. And what this policy has done is that it has fueled sort of um, uh, more radical elements in other regional countries and anti-Western sentiments in countries that are more pro-Western in, in by sort of uh, intuition, because they feel like, you know, they're a victim of this policy. And, uh, you know, the argument is, you know, if this geopolitical blackmail by Serbia works, then maybe we should do a little bit of the same. So this has now created, again, a security problem. 
So I guess the quest needs to question this on whether you know Serbia has that much leverage for the policy to be so Serbia centric. I think there's a little bit of a change now. There's a recalibration, but I think it's it's a little bit too late. And I think the second key reason, the important dynamic that that, that that has been created is that the West has been too inconsistent and divided. And, uh, uh, and, and this has really undermined its credibility in the region. So uh, the EU in particular, it has allowed sort of bilateral disputes to undermine enlargement. You know, enlargement is based on conditionality and conditionality only works if it's based on criteria, democratic criteria. But, you know, you have countries like Kosovo, like, you know, no matter what Kosovo does, it has five countries that don't recognize its independence. Um, you have the case of North Macedonia, which is being, for example, right now blocked by Bulgaria because of a bilateral dispute on history. But then you also have these countries, uh, uh, you know, whose business interests or some who have these transactional interests, which you know uh, produce this soft policy on Serbia, for example, or on, on other authoritarian actors in the region. So you know they don't mind uh, if their uh, their policy becomes softer if you know these these countries offer their companies benefits, you know, lower labor standards in the Western Balkans, or if they provide some security benefits. I think Serbia uh, has, has has benefited by, for example, uh, you know, with this uh, supplying Ukraine with 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 weapons. And so all of this has, you know, this Western approach has, you know, unleashed a very bad set of dynamics. Uh, three, four years ago, together with a group of regional experts, we we published a, a sort of a, a comprehensive report in which we kind of called our situation an, an illiberal equilibrium. So you have in your report these democratizing, cyclical, or authoritarian regimes. Well, you know, so there's positive movement somewhere, negative movement somewhere, but they kind of all revert to the mean. Uh, because what the lack of enlargement has done is that it's signaled to the political elites that you know yeah. uh, that there there is no EU perspective and you can't win uh, in the Western Balkans elections uh, by promising EU accession. So reformists are not empowered. But I think what's also important to highlight what has happened over the last decade is the political economy angle because accession comes with a lot of money, and you know we didn't have the type of transformative amounts of money. Uh, like the other parts of Europe have, have had, that has been replaced by a lot of corrosive capital, which has really, really done a lot of damage in terms of institutional frameworks and regulations and rule of law. So, uh, uh, and and last, but I think the, the key thing is that, you know, uh, by kind of, uh, you know, this policy has not resolved the bilateral and security disputes. And this has allowed regions, uh, leaders around the region, which is in particular, to kind of use this security crisis to undermine criticism, to undermine critics, and you know, it, it has allowed the elites to sort of suppress uh, criticism and you know, and call everybody traitors. So, I think what needs to change is you know, the, to rethink the premises. You know, because if the West keeps treating the Western Balkans as just this security ghetto, you know, it will continue to behave like a security ghetto. And I think the West needs to be more decisive on the bilateral disputes, and and uh, you know uh, there, there can no be they should it should no longer tolerate geopolitical blackmail. Countries should either you know want to join the Western institutions or not, and uh, uh, and and really question the issue of Serbia's leverage. Um, but I think another element that has been missing is support for genuine uh, democratic actors. There's a lot of positive things happening. Um, you know, there's a lot of social movements, uh, and new actors emerging. That would need uh, more support, uh, 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 and uh, and and but but they would also need an anchor or where to where to kind of sort of uh, 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 instill install their hopes in and uh, and you know but now with talk of enlargement coming back after you know especially after Ukraine and Moldova got Canada status you know the West needs to work more a bit to rest restore the credibility of the process because people don't really believe that the process is credible or that it's leading us uh, anywhere. Yeah, thank you. Many, many interesting points there. I think enlargement fatigue being a big part of it, the hypocrisy in uh, prioritizing stability over values and norms. I think we see this, and we talk about this in the report in many places, right? In particular, uh, as a result of the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the kind of cessation of buying gas from Russia, well, much of Europe has replaced that with Azerbaijani energy sources, right? And Aliyev, just in his inauguration speech, said, yes, you know, we're happy to take your money, but you're not going to influence the policies and the, uh, you know, the, our authoritarian bent. And it makes me think about this, this kind of authoritarian cooperation that's also happening, right? You've mentioned Serbia and, and Russia, but I also want to uh, maybe go back to edit um, and think about, you know, in our report, we also, uh, in our uh, 
autocracies kind of aligning, we talk about uh, Hungary and China, right? And we think about this, you mentioned coercive capital or corrosive capital. And this year we designated uh, Hungary as an autocratizing hybrid. I'm wondering Ed, if you could talk about, you know, this high level corruption that's happening. We're seeing now connections between uh, police forces in, in Hungary and China. You know, what are the other things that we're, we're missing when it comes to these kind of corrupt schemes, not only within a particular country, but between countries? Thanks, Mike. Yeah, so we see a very interesting um, two kind of opposite direction trajectories in the country right now. One of them is that the government is taking more uh, kind of aggressive attempts towards Western companies to squeeze them out or, or you know, forcing them, them to, to take over uh, their assets. And at the same time, uh, the government does everything in order to attract Chinese uh, foreign direct investment, which is another bread and butter. Uh, it is it is strategically important and it's a priority for the regime. Um, what I think we can safely say that, that Viktor Orban is trying to make Hungary the economic reach head of China at this moment, especially regarding the Chinese battery factories and green technologies, which is, I think, a little bit of like, there is a lot of spot on the and, and attention on the battery factories, but in general, the green technologies, it's I, it still feels sort of like an underlying problem that is not discussed enough in the public and political discourse. Um, so, so for that kind of goal, uh, the, the Orban government doubled down this pro-Chinese policy. Hungary keeps vetoing EU, EU initiatives that are critical of Beijing. And um, and I think I can say that my, my country became a battering ground for China within within the decision making platforms. Um, and just to give you this kind of like what, what is what is the trigger and the drive behind this is that it is serving one specific goal of the government to maintain the financial durability of, of the urban regime, which is really restrictive to what you mentioned about strategic corruption. Uh, because pushing businesses with China slash Russia or other kind of uh, shady Asian like dictatorships uh, are crucial for the clientelist network of the prime minister. You probably remember this phrase, the Eastern opening strategy, which was kicked off like a decade ago, more than a decade ago in Hungary, um, it's been an instrument, it became a very important instrument for the ruling elite to explore shady Asian markets under the radar of the European Union. It is has been absolutely non-transparent and we have hardcore evidence that, that those who are the closest allies, business allies, and underpinning the system and the stability of Viktor Orban's government, like Ludwig Misers, for instance, that the richest person in Hungary, they're the biggest beneficiaries of this kind of deals. Also, let's not forget the fact that um, Hungary doesn't receive new funds since 2022 or like receiving tremendously less. So so now it's even more crucial to maintain this kind of flow of FDI from these specific countries. Um, these investments are helping in two ways. I think the government to help to enrich their, their network, as I mentioned, by abusing procurement systems and, and to, to consolidate the power. And the second one, which is I think also very important is that these kind of business deals are helping Viktor Orban, the leader of the small, otherwise insignificant country, to depict himself as a key, key global player. Uh, and it also helps him probably to create some wiggle room with the negotiation within the European Union when it comes to different kind of issues. Not to mention the fact, like what it shows about China and China's strategy, uh, how successful it is when it comes to turning the economic leverage and translate it into political influence within the European Union itself. So I think if, if the EU would like to, uh, would need to find a way at least to mitigate this problem, if it cannot or doesn't want to fully eliminate it because of the independences with green technology and so on and so forth, to be able to push its its uh, its green transition. Wow, thank you. Um, we should really turn now to some QA question, Q and A questions from the audience. Uh, you all have humored me with my very detailed questions about what's happening in the region. And I think there's some really important insights that we're getting from the audience uh, about questions that we should ask. And actually, I want to ask David if he would maybe come back on, um, because I have a question here that's about this foreign agents, agents legislation that was that he mentioned uh, in his remarks about how the reintroduction of this foreign agents legislation in, it, by Georgian Dream Party last week. To me, you know, when we wrote the report, and we we gave Georgia its scores. We we mentioned the way that civil society was able to successfully push back on this legislation, 
right? That last year they were the, the uproar that was caused particularly by young people in Georgia. And we see it now in the streets in Georgia. They were able to get the government to kind of backtrack on this plan. Um, but we're also seeing these similar legislation pop up elsewhere. Obviously this, you know, Russia, they're calling it the Russian law in Georgia. And, and that is kind of the, the premier example of this foreign agents legislation. But you can also, we have a question here about the Sovereignty Protection Act in Hungary, which may have similar impacts on civil society there. And then you can think about the Kyrgyz government just signed into law their own foreign agents legislation. Slovakia, uh, an, a, a member of the ruling coalition, just introduced their own version of this. And so I'm, I'm curious as to why this is this particular uh, piece of legislation is viewed so kind of effective by autocrats, why they're so inclined to push through this kind of legislation. Well, let, let me let me start, Mike, first with the specific Georgia case. Um, this came up, as you mentioned, a, a year ago, and the protests that it sparked triggered the Georgian Dream ruling party to withdraw. Um, it is very similar to the Russian NGO legislation, which was roundly condemned, and the Russian legislation was designed to stigmatize uh, civil society organizations, NGOs. And a lot of NGOs in this region depend on outside funding because there just isn't enough indigenous support to sustain them. In the case of Georgia, however, this is one step in a series that we have seen just going back to the EU's offer of candidacy status for Georgia. We saw Benzina Ivanashvili, the uh, billionaire uh, in Georgia, announce his return to politics, not that he ever left. Um, we saw the switch in prime ministers going from bad to worse. Uh, we see, it was seen attacks on the LGBTQ community um, and now the, the NGO proposed legislation. This is a sign that Georgia is moving into an authoritarianizing regime. Um, and I think it's very clear. And unless the West responds rather forcefully, Georgian Dream won't see anything to stop it. And there are elections due in October for parliament. And we need to be, I think, crystal clear with the Georgian Dream and the Georgian government that these kinds of measures move Georgia in the wrong direction. Let's also remember and not lose sight of the fact that the Georgian people remain strongly pro-NATO, pro-EU, pro-West, pro-democracy. The, the larger point, and I'll be very brief here, is because a lot of people in these governments view civil society as the enemy. They don't view them as essential parts of democracy. They don't view them as guardians of freedom and liberties. They view them as calling them out on either misbehavior or corruption or whatever activities they may be engaged in, and they want to go after them and stigmatize them. Civil society organizations, NGOs, play an absolutely indispensable role in any country's democratic development. Um, they, they can be involved in politically oriented issues. They can be involved in health issues. They can be involved in, in uh, supporting libraries. It's a whole range of activities that they're involved in, but it's the ones that are more involved in elections and journalism and, and uh, political party training that seem to be in the sights of these government officials who want to go after them with legislation to try to stigmatize them and force them to declare that they are foreign agents under the influence of foreign powers. Particularly for a government like Georgia that proclaims to be seeking EU membership and that has had historically close ties with the United States, which is the largest funder of, of Georgia, uh, this is deeply offensive um, and, and just a, an indication that Georgia and some of these other initiatives are moving these countries in the wrong direction. Thank you. Uh, we've got another question here about the situation for the LGBT community in this region. And obviously, this is a this is a wide spreading region. We haven't even discussed events in Central Asia, uh, which is you know a woefully undercovered and under um, discussed region here. But I'm wondering, perhaps Oana, if you have any thoughts on sort of you know these issues of, of violence against women of the LGBTQ community. You know, human rights. We've seen how they're trending down in their region. Uh, in fact, my colleagues, Mary uh, Hopkins and Alexander Carpi, wrote an excellent blog today about how declining institutions have real world impacts on people's fundamental rights. 
I want to, could you maybe speak to, you know, what are the causes of this kind of illiberal turn and this sort of othering that we often see in many of these countries that leads to violence against women's discrimination against the LGBT community? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, essentially, and this will be a continuation of what I said earlier, um, and, and that is that there's this wave of anti-establishment, um, anti-EU, anti-Western, um, say, political narratives that, that are coming and, and um, carried by radical political forces, obviously. Um, and I was saying that they're opportunists and they're not necessarily always ideological. Um, so, you know, what do you find when, when people are dissatisfied, not necessarily with their living standards, um, but they're dissatisfied with the fact that they're not feeling represented politically, then you need to find something that will, say, unite their anger uh, into a common thread. And, and, and that seems to be very often across the region, the idea that traditional ways of life are, are under threat by the West, by the European Union. These are societies, you know, and, and, I'm, and I'm talking um, even about Central Europe, not necessarily uh, candidate countries, I'm, I'm talking about EU member states. Um, our countries, our societies have not fully modernized. And, and, and that is one of the reasons why many of them feature as um, not fully consolidated democracies in your report. Um, so what that means is that just as we were opening up more to more human rights, to more freedom for um, women, for the LGBTQ community, for uh, people of, of different ethnicity, religion, race, and so on and so forth, so for more diversity, uh, this was stopped in its tracks by this wave of, uh, um, of opposition to liberal forces, um, which is heading now to social conservatism. And, and this is essentially what we're dealing with. This narrative that we are, um, that we're seeing an assault on traditional values by the liberal forces, by the ruling elites that are subservient to this sort of uh, global conspiracy that's led by the West and is um, meant to dilute the, the essence of um, our identity as being defined by tradition and, and traditional values. Um, and obviously, then the result is that uh, people will sign up to that. It's, it's um, you know, it's it's natural resistance. Um, I think it's also oversight by um, by successive governments and and by the political class that transition uh, to modernity and 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 EU accession has generated. Uh, a class of winners, but also a class of losers. We we have huge inequality in these countries, in many cases, growing inequality. Um, so there are people who have genuinely benefited from, um, say, EU accession or the prospect of EU accession, um, because very often these things are interlinked. But there are also a lot of people that on an individual level haven't really seen their living standards improve. They have they have seen that on a macroeconomic level. And it's even more frustrating if you see that all around you, there are others who have benefited, but you personally haven't. Uh, and, and your access to infrastructure, to education, to healthcare has not really improved. Um, and so what, what that means is you're ready to accept the narrative that this is a side effect of um, of Western um, neo-colonialism, uh, let's say, and and that is exactly how very often this is framed in in our countries by disinformation and misinformation and propaganda. So I I, I do believe that it's this turn to more social conservatism, to resistance to transformation, and a form of protest. Um, by by those who feel that they have been overlooked by the political elites, that's driving this um, this blowback uh, against human rights in general. Like I said, minorities of of all sorts, not just the LGBTQ uh, community. And and that's I I think that's very dangerous because the the trend that we're seeing is consolidating around the globe. Um, it is uh, the the uh, again as I was pointing out. The geopolitical circumstances are really not favorable. We're seeing again around the globe uh, rising challenges 
to the Western system of values, uh, we're seeing rising challenges to um, to the, the 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 global system that's based on rules and norms, um, and so uh, it's not looking good for human rights acro across the world. And 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 if in Europe we're experiencing this now. Uh, it is unlikely that we're going to see an improvement in the coming years. I'd, I'd rather say uh, we are going to see continual deterioration, um, at least in the in the near future. And that's that's a really sad development. And I'm not seeing the leadership in Europe to pick this up um, and, and try to um, restore these societies to the path of modernization and liberalization. A rather depressing view of the future, but perhaps understandable, honestly, after the 20 years of, of democratic decline that we've already documented in this report. But you talked about this this class of winners and classes class of losers that this the sense within Europe. And Egon, I wonder how do accession countries view this, right? They're looking in to the European Union and they're seeing both, you know, kind of prosperity and security. But also they're hearing these narratives and seeing the kind of Euro skepticism within the union itself. And so, I mean, what is does the EU still have a transformative uh, power for this region? If And if so, you know, can does it help? How, how does the Western Balkans get back on the path to the EU? I think the, the transformative power has been uh, lost, so we cannot talk about the kind of transformative power that, for example, the previous succession waves have had, you know, the, the countries of Central Europe or Eastern Europe that joined the EU, they kind of rode a wave of political will, both within the EU and within their countries uh, to sort of... Uh, 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 um, uh, you know, a push for reforms, which have, you know, all these friction effects, but then it's worth it because you get something back. Um, I think this halt in enlargement, this the last decade that I've kind of mentioned, has really uh, has really caused uh, long-term and irreversible effects. So it's not like enlargement stopped for a decade and now can you know restart again from the point where it stopped. No, it's restarting, uh, you know, hopefully, and we're still not sure whether it's restarted from a point of regress. So instead of convergence over the last decade, I think as a region, there was quite a lot of uh, divergence, both geopolitically and, and within the countries we've become weaker, our institutions have become weaker. Um, I, I do fear that there is, you know, uh, so so if, you know, if people don't really read the signal from the EU, um, uh, the, uh, the, our domestic constituency for democracy uh, remains weak. Uh, it's there, uh, but it's weak. Most people who have this sort of pro-democracy or pro-EU inclinations, you know, are still prioritizing economic or security concerns over anything else. So as long as, you know, uh, I have a job and, you know, uh, and or, or, or leaders are keeping our safe, you know, they can, re, you know, repress freedoms. But I think what's also important to highlight is that uh, this is a phenomenon that's happened in, in countries that even joined the EU and, and sort of backtracked later, is that we're seeing an out-migration of uh, sort of critical middle classes that, are, that, that, that will be the sort of the drivers of, of democratic reforms. And we're, we're experiencing this without uh, joining. Uh, uh, maybe some, you know, as I said, uh, maybe the tides will turn. I think Ukraine gave a lot of inspiration uh, for, you know, initially, especially in the first year. Um, but uh, but I, I don't see that energy and I don't see, you know, and, and it's not only the West's fault. energy is now being channeled into, uh, and you mentioned this and Juana spoke about this on these um, identity issues, sort of, you know, so if people are unhappy, they channeling it through nationalism, through, uh, you know, uh, social conservative causes. And, and this is um, uh, an area where foreign actors have have, have an advantage. You know, they, they always amplify or fuel these narratives um, and just to sort of push and polarize uh, these uh, uh, societies. Um, so, uh, you know, for maybe the only country right now where people are protesting for democracy with EU flags is Georgia, uh, you know, and there was some sort of spirit like that maybe in Moldova, but in the Western Balkans, the EU has lost that sort of symbolic power of, you know, uh, people uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, 
doing something because they believe it will take them in, in a better place. Um, and uh, I, I don't know what needs to happen for that. I don't have an answer. We are struggling to find that answer. Uh, but we need to, I, I think, refocus our energy into our domestic uh, sort of constituency, expanding our constituency, uh, uh, and maybe just highlighting how much we're losing. Uh, because while everything, all of this is happening, another area of, of concern is that the gap between the Western Balkans and its neighbors is widening. Like just over the next couple of years, you know, the amount of money, EU money, that uh, countries like Croatia will get compared to what is being offered to the Western Balkans by the EU is just, you know, a, a tremendously more for, for, for those who are members. And this is widening the economic gap. So we need to talk more in the region about what we're losing uh, by sort of, you know, through these uh, bilateral disputes uh, with authoritarian leaders who are uh, sort of dividing on identity basis. Uh, and then uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, try to shift the narrative from security to back to democracy and hope that this EU door will uh, continue to be open uh, because if, if it shuts down again, and right now there is a bit of an opening, but if it shuts down again and if, and if Ukraine loses, and David mentioned this, how important that event will be, uh, I, I, I fear that uh, the sort of the negative uh, trends will sort of uh, be more powerful and, and, you know, uh, and amplify the negative dynamics rather than the positive ones. I think you made a really important point there, but you didn't put in the exact words, but civic education, informing the civic, the public of what is happening in their own countries, right? Because a big part of hybrid regimes and and countries with, you know, illiberal autocratic leaders is the control of the information sector, right? You have me, I've got a book, Spin Dictators, right? And, and they've learned how to use this machine to push a very specific uh, set of ideas about what's going on in their country and who's to blame and who's benefiting in such a way that people don't have accurate information. And, and until we address you know, that's a, that's a key component of any democracy is that yeah. citizens and voters know what's happening in their countries and be able to go and vote and change that. And so I think it's important that we take work, to say nations in transit, and do more going to the region, not just talking amongst ourselves as kind of experts on democracy and, and governance, but really talking with, with, you know, average citizens in many of these countries about what's happening. Um, Which is which is why I'm just to add like control, the, the heavy control over the media narratives by author authoritarian regimes, I think a key is a key factor for why, you know, not an obstacle to doing what you just said. You know? Absolutely. I'm going to toss one more question towards David and, and somebody in the audience has asked, you know, how is it possible that Nations in Transit has re recognized Ukraine as being more democratized, even though elections have been canceled and President Zelensky has, you know, wide authority under martial law. It's against Ukrainian law to conduct elections if the country is under martial law. Uh, and so President Zelensky and the Ukrainian Rada are following Ukrainian law. They're, the strong sentiment among Ukrainian, uh, the Ukrainian people it, it reflected in recent surveys supports this position. They uh, recognize that uh, following Ukrainian law, not conducting elections in the current environment uh, is the right way forward. It is incredibly difficult to conduct elections when 18% uh, of your territory is occupied by a foreign force, in this case, Russia, when uh, you have uh, millions of displaced individuals. And so the elections will take place once martial law is lifted and martial law will be lifted once Russian forces leave Ukrainian territory. Um, it, it, Ukraine has made progress when it comes to fighting corruption. It has made progress in judicial reform, despite the fact that it has been completely consumed by fending off Russian invading forces. So I think the nations in transit is right to recognize the progress Ukraine has made and to also understand why elections have not taken place. Thank you. So we're running out of time here. We've only got a few minutes left and I wanna wrap up with just a lightning round of a quick question. And that is, what gives you hope? What gives you hope about the future of democracy, democratic governance, and dem democracy's institutions in this region? What are you looking for to kind of get you through the day uh, as we see kind of 20 years of, of democratic decline in this region? What is it that gives you hope? I'm going to start with uh, Edith. All right. I will be really brief, as you asked for. 
um, I would probably put my hope into those generations, for instance, that we witnessed in Poland, who just came out now from the shade to cast a ballot, who has been who has been moved by uh, an initiative which was tapping into the, the 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 positive and negative emotions of the people when it comes to both their own personal security and their economic security, and uh, somehow they, they resembled hope for this kind of sense of duty and togetherness and and they felt like it's time to cast a ballot i know i mean it takes two sides so you would need to have an effective oppositional coordination and the 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 skill set to be able to talk and and mobilize them but i think we we should definitely focus on them and it has been mentioned many times throughout the discussion how important civic education is the ultimately most important uh, and powerful tool in order to generate mutual engagement, not only the engagement of this part of the society, but also the elderly who have different other issues that are concerned with, uh, you mentioned the LGBTQI, the gender, the symbolic glue, and this kind of cultural fight, probably they, they resonate to that a lot, lot, lot more intensely. So they, it would need to be tailor-made, but, uh, but, but I really hope that, that eventually also Hungary is going to get to the point where this kind of mutual engagement and civic dutiness is not going to be impossible, but but would 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 make it possible to um to to overturn this type of uh, repressive regimes, which is actually interested in keeping you down and at home and not to cast a ballot at all, unless you're voting for the regime, of course. Thank you, Agon. What gives you hope? Um, in the case of the Western Balkans, I think it's very very important that we are surrounded by NATO and EU, and some of us are some of the countries are NATO members. I think that's a major uh, source of resilience. I would not be able to say the same thing. I get, I think for other regions. So in this global environment, this is a very important factor. I would say that what gives me hope is the rise of new social movements throughout the region, thematic, working on gender, environment, you know, if these constituencies could be expanded uh, uh, more and to provide sort of some sort of more uh, resistance to authoritarian regimes and change the narratives, I think, I think there is, they, they, they can become political actors and open up political space. And the third thing is, I, what gives me hope is the fact that Authoritarians ultimately don't deliver. You know, they provide these short, uh, you know, short-term sort of fixes, uh, which people might, you know, vote for for them, you know, in one or two elections. But ultimately, they deteriorate the situation. And just look at what's happening with Hungary. You know, in terms of GDP per capita, you know, the economy is not do is doing much worse than the peer uh, sort of regional countries. So ultimately, uh, they are following a failed route. It's just a matter of democratic forces to exploit those and, and, and shift the conversation sooner rather than later. Thank you. Alana, in a few words, what gives you hope? Um, I would agree very much with Agon, and, and, and I would say two things. One, um, I think we are going to see this wave of um, opportunist populism and radicalism over the next few years. Um, but at some point, just as it happened in Poland, this is going to show its its limitations. Um, and and I, I'm hoping for a reversal. I think at the same time, um, there are emergent um, political um, movements that are liberal, are democratic and are European in nature. And um, we're also going to increasingly feel backlash against uh, radicalism and, and the need to close ranks in 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 the face of um, external threats. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is uh, um, the the vibrant democratic activity that's taking place outside of politics. Um, as I was mentioning, we're seeing this very entrepreneurial civil society in many places in, in our region. I think we're, we're seeing a lot of um, the, the activity with, with citizens demanding agency and, and demanding to have a voice. Uh, and I'm hoping that sooner or later, this is going to be poured into um, political institutions because ultimately that's where the decision making processes lie. Um, so, so this is what what gives me hope for the future. And David, lastly to you, the Ukrainian people, their courage, their bravery, their determination to win that gives me hope. Thank you. I'll say what gives me hope is everybody who attended today's briefing, who took an interest in this work and who cares deeply about democracy in the nations in transit region. Thank you all. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you everyone who attended. And of course, a huge thank you to all of our country report authors who work diligently to provide us with accurate information about what's happening in many of these countries. So thank you. Please enjoy the rest of your day. And of course, check out freedomhouse.org for more information on all of this. Thank you.